Welcome back, everyone. Today, I wanted to talk about a subject that I've mentioned a couple times on this channel, which is the concept of invasiveness in biology, because it deals heavily with insects and their movement around the world, and how it is a failed concept largely uh, because of a failure to define terms and the fact that a lot of it res rests on non-biological uh, concepts, and such as values in economics and aesthetics. But how this came about today was that I was looking at articles about monarch butterflies and their conservation because there have been growing calls for the monarch to be classified as endangered in the U.S., which I do kind of support, but there are issues which are not being addressed, uh, such as avocado trade in Mexico, which is decimating populations in the overwintering sites of monarch butterflies that the U.S. doesn't really want to deal with because it would require us to probably to ban the trade of avocados, which the public wouldn't support. But that's for a different video. Um, but this this uh, article on monarchs in Australia and New Zealand popped up, and it kind of blew my mind because I know quite a bit about monarchs in North America, but apparently monarchs are found in a lot of other places as well, specifically the North American monarch. This These aren't other species of uh, Danus. These are specifically Danus plexippus. Uh, so this is the North American, Central American monarch species. So I had no idea that the monarch was in Australia and New Zealand. And this led me down a rabbit hole, which loops back into this invasiveness debate. Uh, the monarch butterfly is not really native, what we would call native, to Australia and New Zealand. It gradually worked its way there through a series of island hopping starting really in from Hawaii uh, and working its way down, which is kind of strange. Um, and this is thought to have occurred through a series of storms. Basically, these large tropical storms pushing the monarch butterfly from the western United States and western Mexico across the Pacific Ocean and island hopping across uh, these various islands. So you can see here, um, it's low, low resolution, but thinking it's like 1840, maybe 1840 for New Zealand, as well as Hawaii. But eventually it makes its way across all of these South Pacific islands, establishes itself in Indonesia and Malaysia and Borneo and Papua New Guinea and all these uh, island nations, and, all, and eventually into Australia in 1870. So it kind of rode these storms across the Pacific, and it established itself into an area... Uh, on a lot of these islands, there are milkweeds on these islands, some of them native, some of them invasive, in Australia, uh, or I say invasive, introduced. And some some of this, uh, some of these milkweeds in Australia ended up being North American milkweeds that were probably brought in as part of gardening, uh, because milkweeds do tend to produce really pretty flowers and they grow really well, so the Europeans brought them over. So you had this spread of monarchs across the Pacific like this, which I was completely unaware of. And apparently there are weird island varieties of these where you, you know, kind of weird morphotypes. So like in Hawaii, there's a white monarch butterfly. It's the same species, but it's a white morphotype, which looks really cool. So we have these monarchs now in uh, New Zealand and Australia, and they've adapted pretty well. They don't generally feed on the native milkweeds too much. They prefer the North American milkweeds, which makes sense because those are the ones that they would normally be feeding on. And they've even, over the last 150 years, established a migratory cycle, just like they have in North America, where they migrate to different parts of Australia, depending on the season, and they have multiple generations, all of the, all of the same sort of biology that you see in North America. So how this loops back to invasiveness. Uh, and just so you know, if you haven't seen milkweed, this is what a milkweed plant looks like. It, they do make pretty flowers and they grow really well, uh, which is why we call them a weed, because at least in North America, they kind of grow everywhere uh, that you don't tend to. So with these uh, articles that I found, the monarch is disappearing in Australia and New Zealand as well, or I shouldn't say disappearing, their populations are falling. And so there have been increasing calls from the public and from the government and stuff for more conservation efforts for monarch butterflies because people like them. We're talking about now major conservation pushes for multiple introduced species. So you have all of these milkweeds that were introduced, which the monarchs are dependent on, and then preservation efforts for this introduced monarch butterfly. Uh, 
and I, this comes to the point that I've been made that I've been making in other videos, which is ultimately invasiveness is not a biological concept. This is a concept embedded in economic values and aesthetics. If a species isn't costing us anything and we like having it around, we don't generally call them invasive. And instead, we, in this case, set up conservation efforts for them, regardless of their, nati their nativeness to an area. If it's an ugly species or the species causes us problems, we hear this uh, chorus of invasive species are destroying nature. This is an aberration of the natural order. Why would people move these around and, and so forth uh, and so on? And there isn't really a standard besides this is causing us problems, therefore bad. This is something that we like, therefore good. And it just kind of wears this skin suit of biological legitimacy and arguments over, you know, native distribution and all this other nonsense that isn't really what we're concerned about. In fact, if you just go back a few years for the Australian uh, monarch butterfly, this was published in 2015 versus this article that was published just in the last couple of days, uh, they, they have conservationists in, the, in this article, which are talking about how awful the monarchs are, and um, not that they're doing a significant amount of damage or anything, but just they're awful because they're not from Australia. And at the end, the conservation says, we call plants weeds in these particular cases, but the reality is that the butterfly is a flying weed. And which is just, you can tell just from his uh, framing of the situation that this is not a biological argument. Weeds are not a biological classification for plants. Weeds are what we call plants that we don't want around for economic or aesthetic reasons. Uh, something that's growing in a field isn't necessarily a weed unless we want to plant something in that field. And now it's growing where we don't want it, so now it's a weed. This is a, a value judgment of the plant, not a biological assessment of the situation. So this raises a bunch of questions like, you know, we call these things weeds, but that's not a biological classification. So why are biologists and conservations, conservationists talking like this? You're talking about economics and aesthetics. You're not talking about biology. Why are we listening to biologists when they talk about this? Uh, it's, you know, you're kind of way off on a limb here. And it kind of, again, where's this skin suit of biology? But really, we're talking about uh, economics and we're talking about philosophical aesthetics. But also, if a population of a place like Australia, if the if the human population of a place like Australia wants to preserve uh, and start a conservation program for these milkweeds and their monarchs, even if they're, you know, quote unquote, invasive in that ecosystem, then what are the conservationists in this situation actually advocating for? They are, you know, advocating for the destruction of beautiful things that people like so that they can fulfill their, better fulfill their ideological vision uh, that is dressed up in this like legitimacy of scientific truth. And that's not what's happened. That's that's not, these are not scientific categories. That's not what is happening here. But then there's other questions like this butterfly has been there for 150 years. It's reestablished its life cycles. It's reestablished its, you know, uh, migratory patterns on an entirely different continent. At what point do you just say, okay, this is now native? If, if 600 generations of monarchs in that 150 years uh, an establishment and like a stable ecosystem establishment of, of their patterns of behavior within the Australian continent doesn't make them native, how long does it take before we say, okay, this species is native and we're not going to talk about it, it being invasive anymore? Uh, it, would a thousand years be enough? Like it, at what point do we draw that line? But additionally, if these butterflies were moved in by storms, does that constitute invasion or is that just natural spread? Because these, sure, the hosts were, the invasive hosts at least, or the introduced hosts were spread by people, but there are native hosts on a lot of these islands anyway. So is this a natural spread or is this invasion? And if it's natural, what about its reliance on an invasive host like milkweed? Does that negate its legitimacy as a natural uh, spread of a species? It, it, it's not like it would, would have established, it probably at least wouldn't have established in Australia without those um, North American milkweeds there. So does that make it more invasive or does it not matter? There's a lot of questions here because invasiveness isn't a well-defined category of scientific legitimacy. 
Like this, this is a philosophical and economic category where you end up weighing pros and cons based on the local population and the local problems. So I'll link these articles if you want to read them. And I'm still working. I really need to finish up this other monarch, uh, North American monarch conservation thing, because I do think it's a good, a good idea that we conserve the monarchs in North America. Because again, if you just want to make it from an aesthetic argument, people like them. They're beautiful. People like having them around. People are fascinated by their migration. Uh, but the measures that need to be taken to preserve them need to be more uh, severe than what people are thinking. But I'll get into that another time. Uh, like and subscribe, and I'll talk to you guys later.